All right, so I just thought we'd start off with, with another practice, um, NMR, IR. I don't think this is the same as any of the ones that, that we've done so far, right? We didn't do any that had quartet triplet labeled like that, right? Okay. And I, was, I was telling Hannah, um, please bear with me today. I have one of those headaches that makes it hard to keep um, that coherent thought in your head. So if I say something that doesn't make sense, just ask me to clarify. I stopped, I stopped really doing any drinking when um, we found out Laura was pregnant. So I'm supposed to be waking up fewer viewers, but this feels like one of those that wear sunglasses inside, don't talk to me, sort of thing yeah. over that I get those sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes the light is not there. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Thought of another way I can give you problems like this that is less OCHEM focused, but it's a reminder of how systems of equations work um, for organic compounds. If you don't know the formula, um, I thought of a way I can just give you a problem like this where you can work out what the formula is um, from just from gas laws and system of equations. But it is a bit of a bear. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, what do we notice about this NMR? Or sorry, IR. So the IR first. So it's like uh, this. Yeah, there's something weird going on. If I was getting really careful here, it, might be all sp3 but at the same time it, the formula makes that seem odd because we have two degrees of unsaturation so but then we also have a lot of oxygens and no alcohols so if it's all sp3 carbon hydrogens, there are no sp2 hydrogens, then that means that all of our degrees of unsaturation are either rings or um, carbonyls, which is certainly possible. The fact that there's that 1736 is only one peak, but it is kind of broad for a carbonyl. So it's possible that there are two different carbonyls that are sort of buried in there. Um, if we had really good resolution, we might expect to see two, two distinct esters showing up as two peaks. Um, but with that peak being kind of broad, it'd be, it's a hard, hard to tell whether that's one or two identical esters or two unique esters. Um, but I think two esters certainly 
makes the most sense given the lack of SP2 hydrogens. Want lights? This is good. Okay. What else can we tell? Looks like that. Uh, well, if it was a carboxylic acid, we'd be seeing it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's yeah, a possibility. Not yeah, not the carboxylic acid OH. Possibly. But yeah, we do want to be careful of looking at the fingerprint region with any sort of agenda necessarily. I'm trying to read the tea leaves there, um, but it's certainly a possibility and that fits with esters, right? Because those are acid derivatives. Um, the proton NMR is fairly interesting though too, right? <laughs> At the very least, and maybe one one two wouldn't make much sense. We need a total of of eight, but two two four would make sense. Um, we had, we had C or sorry no it's fourteen C eight. C8 H14. So that all of a sudden maybe 223 is seven, right? So we could double that since we only have three. Because it doesn't look like it's a true double if this if these are the same. That one looks more like it's it's not quite double, right? That would make the integration work out because you know really it's four, four, six, and the triplet and the quartet right next to each other or not right next to each other might work with that as well, right? Because when you have a triplet with an integration of three, that's a pretty good indication that you've got a methyl group, right? Um, and actually, not just a methyl, an ethyl specifically, right? Because the triplet means it has two next door neighbors. And then you've got a quartet, which means three nearest neighbors. With an integration of two relative to each other, right? So the quartet and the triplet peaks are both sort of indicative of an ethyl group, where the CH two is where the R does not have any hydrogen. So we don't know exactly what the R part looks like. We know that that first carbon probably doesn't have any hydrogen. If it's even a carbon, it could be, since we're, we think we're dealing with esters, we could be dealing with ethyl esters. And if we double check our figures, go back to actually see if there's a better figure for uh, NMR. 
what is our textbooks NMR spectra section on that? Is that a good one? Okay. Values. A lot of times it's one of those things that right inside the covers. A lot of times you see it in functional groups. I actually can't remember because I just have like yes and like. Yeah, clearly I, I do the same thing. Basic one, um, esters aren't specifically put on here though. So we want some, a little more detail. I think the one that we were using in lab was from probably uh, nice at this point, we can just go back to it. That's um, <laughs> you guys were here. I knew it. I was like, is, is it happening? What's going on? <laughs> Sorry, I was like, I'm just trying to find where I stored my my uh, files so we can look at the NMR stuff. All right, well, try one more place and then we'll go to another text or we'll go to that um, compound chemistry one. Where that one is. There it is. All right, so proton NMR on the left hand side. If we had a CH2 next to a carbonyl, or CH3 next to a carbonyl, we would expect them to be between two and three. If you have a CH2 on one side of an ester, on the oxygen side of an ester, we would expect it to be up around four to five. Do see that so that is a pretty good indicator that it might be looking at that CH2 right here might be attached to the oxygen of an ester. A symmetric diester, yeah, which make a lot of sense given that we only have three proton signals. The NMR or the IR had almost nothing in it other than a carbonyl and some SP3 hydrogens. So with that in mind, we might be looking something like I need to sign down on this call, but it's okay. You know we've got a CH3, or we pretty sure we've got a CH3, CH2 happening, and that probably two of them based on the integration. And then the CH2 based on chemical shift. Might look something like that. And I believe that doesn't quite get us halfway to our formula, right? We need eight carbons. We need eight carbons and we a total of 14 hydrogens. So we Maybe something like this. Kind of an odd looking structure, but I think the formula fits, right? So CH3, CH2, oxygen, 
carbonyl CH2 right in the middle. That doesn't quite work yet, still, right? We're still short one carbon, maybe CH2, CH2. It would. If this is a CH, except that we would we would expect even if they're symmetric, we would expect some splitting if we had CH two CH two in the middle. This makes this work, but it doesn't make the formula work because that's C that's C seven H twelve. You want C eight H fourteen. So what else could we be looking at? That's something weird going on where we've got, I guess maybe we might, we might need to get, could we be looking at, would be two, three, four, Add up to either seven or fourteen. These fit so nicely with an ethyl group, but maybe we don't want to get too too attached to that idea. Let's look at the carbon anymore. Maybe that'll tell us something interesting. So the proton decoupled is a regular carbon anymore, and it has four signals. It's three that are labeled solvent. Just that's it's labeled solvents that tell us to just ignore it. Um, and you do see that very frequently. If you have solvent, if you have a little bit of acetone left over in your in your sample, um, it'll show up in your carbon anymore, but it'll always show up in the exact same spot because it's not coupling with your actual sample. And so it's really easy to tell, oh, it showed up at these, these three peaks showed up at this chemical ship. That's absolutely acetone and we can just ignore it. Um, so four distinct carbons. And one of which is down into the very deep shielded region. Four distinct carbon means we got some amount of symmetry, right? Because we need we need eight carbons to show up as four signals. So we have some symmetry there. Um, so let's look at what the chemical shifts look like. So what shows up between 160 and 200? Kind of what we Esther's what we expected, right? An ester. Okay, so one of our signals is an ester. That's confirmation that what we were thinking must be the case based on the IR is probably true. Um, but in the fact that there's only one signal there, though, that does give us that extra confidence that this is a single carbonyl peak. It's not two esters on top of each other because if it was we'd be seeing two esters on top of each other right here too. Um, because NMR is always better resolved than IR. You can trust it more to, than we would be seeing two peaks there. IR, everything tends to, to pile up on top of each other. And the DEPT-135 was the one that, um, where with, when we coupled the protons, the, direction it faced told us it was CH, CH2, CH3. If there are no carbons, it doesn't show up at all. So again, that's our, our esters um, are, is up here and it doesn't show up in a couple spectrum. And these two pointing downward 
not sure if I pulled out the cheat sheet in the actual assignment or if it's just in the if it's just in the slides. But pointing downward meant it was a CH two, right? Pointing upward was a CH three or a CH. So, and one thing that is really nice about these carbon NMR as well is that the shielding goes qualitatively in the same order as the proton NMR. So usually, whatever is furthest to the right in the carbon NMR is also the signal that's furthest to the right in the proton NMR. Um, there are some weird exceptions where they can get out of order, but they're pretty uncommon. Generally, you can count on the shielding to be the same for the carbon NMR as the proton NMR. So that would mean that this first one that we, the triplet, goes with this one, which is pointing upwards, so that's our CH3. And we only have one CH3 pointing upward. And then we have two CH2s. So I'm starting to think that our structure up there is right, where we have two CH2s in the middle, but because they're identical, splitting doesn't come. Because remember, the splitting is a result of when you can have some things on one carbon showing up um, with the opposite spin of the adjacent carbons. And that's what makes it show up and be kind of a bell curve. It has to do with Pascal's triangle and uh, the combinatorial way you can arrange things. But if your protons are chemically identical, they won't show up as splitting because you can't tell the difference between the two signals, right? Even though they're on different carbons, because the carbons are symmetrically identical, you won't see the splitting. And all of a sudden that makes our proton NMR make sense with the structure we were looking at over here. If I add the, the extra two hydrogens in the middle, So I was not trying to ask you a trick question at, at uh, eight in the morning. Because this structure works for everything except for what, what we would expect for the splitting in the middle, right? But then when you take into account this, that those are two identical protons, right? So that's one of those rules that's, that's where if you don't live in the NMR world, you might forget that. Yeah. I presented it, I was not trying to be tricky by presenting it to you the way I did. It's one of those things where I have to work it through in my head every time I see that, whether that's, that's the rule or not. But if you, if you can remember that the splitting has to do with having chemically distinct protons on the carbons next door, all of a sudden the symmetry of that makes it like, oh, okay, maybe I, maybe that's that weird case that I should go back and read up on, double check that again. There's like two signals stacked on top. Almost the back of life. Right. And so and you do see that the other thing, the other place that you see weird stuff happening with with um, proton NMR signals is protons that you think should be identical, um, but are limited based on rotations. So like for instance, the cis proton um, versus the trans proton on a on a um, Alkene. So if we just had propene, just counting carbons, we have, we have three chemically distinct carbons, right? And so we would expect, since all the carbons have protons, that that's three chemically distinct protons as well. 
Um, it's actually four chemically distinct protons. <coughs> Excuse me. Because that proton is not quite the same chemical environment as that one, even though they're on the same carbon. The fact that this hydrogen is cis relative to the methyl, and this one's trans relative to the methyl, means they might show up in a proton in Mars, two different signals. So if you you, if you, uh, you may not have noticed, but if you go back and look at your notes, we haven't done much the way NMR, where we have um, alkenes or where we have rings even, other than, than benzene rings. Because even in a, ben, in a cyclohexyl ring, something being on one side of the ring versus the other means technically it's very slightly distinguishable. And so with a good enough NMR, you will actually have that show up as two signals, even though they're on the same carbon. So they're, you know, I'm, I'm not dumbing it down so much as we're not getting into all the possibilities because there's a lot of really subtle ways you can have chemical, chemically distinct protons. And occasionally, when you have chemically identical hydrogens, things work a little, look a little different too. Right, so this is definitely a case where having the proton in a part of that carbon in our was really what did it for us because we have only had four signals in the carbon in our right. So we know we have to have four distinct carbons. And there's really not a way we can arrange that formula that fits the rest of our data um, that has that would make this splitting make sense without considering them, them being identical. And all of this is gone into in more depth in the in the textbook as well. Um, you know, get later on in the proton section. Um, it talks about fair bit about how you can, whether they would be the same or not. So these, yeah, so this is, we would expect these two hydrogens to be, I guess because it's symmetrical above the ring and below the ring, they might be showing up as the same signal. But if you only have a single methyl group, these two might show up as two different signals basically on top of each other. So sometimes it looks like what, um, what we call a doublet of triplets. We would expect these to show up with a triplet splitting because they have three next door neighbors, or sorry, two next door neighbors. But sometimes it looks like two triplets overlaid on top of each other. Um, and that, so when you get weird splitting like that, it's probably that you have some sort of hindered rotation either to two pi bonds or ring structures. Also, just another good example of we're not always going to get something that we can say, you know, a smoking gun sort of. I know with 99.9% .9 certainty it's this compound. Sometimes the best you can do with these is I don't really like this structure, but it fits better than any other option that I can think of right now. And maybe you're missing an option, but maybe that is the way it is, and there's some other weird variable that you're not considering or that you're not aware of. All right, let's just because when I couldn't sleep over the weekend, I was how I got these topic in my head, but instead of counting sheep, so I was balancing reactions um, more or less. And I was thinking to myself about the assignment that I left you with for, for your lab. And how we always, I always, you know, you always know what the formula is, generally speaking. And could you really do these problems if you didn't know the formula? Um, or how would we measure the formula using pretty basic? How could we actually get the empirical evidence for the formula pretty, um, using pretty basic equipment? Um, and so one of the things I came up with is, and one of the things that, that, that does get used is a lot of times what 
figure out the formula of the organic compounds, um, you start by burning it. You burn it and you measure how much gas you had before and how much gas you have after. And you can't always tell the difference between the gases. And so I started thinking about, okay, well, what would be the minimum amount of information we would need to be able to, to work backwards? And so I started treating it like a system of equations. So if we think, if we know that we don't have any, that we have an organic compound and all we have is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it, but we don't know in what ratio. We could write it as CX, HY, O, Z. We don't know what X, Y, and Z are, but we know we can burn it if we put it with oxygen. Myself more room there. So we need it in a minute. And we know when we burn it, if we burn it completely, we're going to get CO2 in water, right? One of the first reactions we learned about back in Gen Chem. How would you balance this? Let's assume that we're past Gen Chem and that we're not strictly speaking stuck to using only integer numbers. We want it to be integer numbers. It needs to be in, you know, easily understandable, but we can use fractions. So you guys have seen um, combustion reactions and enthalpy reactions where we have like a half a mole of something, right? So let's assume that we can use fractions how many CO2s are we going to get? We can't put a number to it. Something with X's and Z's, right? What? Not even Z's, really. Okay. There's a only, carbon's only coming from one source, right? So, and it's only going to one product. So however many carbons we have on the left, we have to have that many CO2s on the right. And what do we know about how many water molecules we'll make? Y over two. However many hydrogens we have, we're gonna take them all and turn them into water, right? So how many oxygen molecules do we need? Well, every CO2 is one oxygen, right? Go ahead, Anna. X times two. Why times two? There's two in each carbon dioxide, so that it would be X times two for oxygen and atoms. But since we're dealing with, with O2 as a molecule, we're going to get that divided by two immediately, right? So however many CO2s we make, we need at least that many O2s. And what else do we need? What else is our oxygen turning into? Right? And every water has one oxygen, right? So in terms of why, how many water molecules, or how many oxygens do we need um, for the water molecules? Y over two, over two, right? Because, because every oxygen atom could make one water, and so we need y over two oxygen atoms, which means we need y over two over two oxygen molecules. So y over four. Minus z, good. Because we might have some oxygens in there already. However many oxygens we already have there, 
Is it just minus C or do we need another over two or over four? Because we're talking oxygen molecules for balance and not oxygen atoms. So that doesn't look nearly as friendly as, as guess and check balancing, but it is because we just balanced it for any possible organic compound that is only oxygen, carbon, and, and hydrogen. Um, so we actually removed the guess and check part from balancing combustion reactions. And if we want whole numbers, if we balance this and we get something um, and X plus Y over four minus Z over two is not a whole number, we just have to multiply everything by two and then it will be a whole number. Because since we know that Y is gonna be an even number, we know that when we put, when we plug in all our numbers here, this whole thing would be, it's either going to be a whole number or it's going to be over two, something over two. So if we happen to balance this and based on our numbers of Y, we wind up in um, Z, we wind up with something that's over two. We just take the entire thing, multiply by two, and we've got a balanced reaction with all integers. General solution. The general solution to balancing or organic reaction. Now, why was this interesting or useful? Well, if we can have a general solution based on X, Y, and Z, that means if we, we can actually write an ice table for this now that it's balanced, it's gonna be a really pain in the butt solution for these, it's not going to be minus 2x or plus 2x, right? It's going to be, you know, your starting amount of oxygen minus x plus y over 4 minus z over 2 times your starting times your change. But we can solve this. So if we leave it, and we're actually going to do the math of this right now. Um, I just want to remind you how ice table system equations work. Let's say we know we have a certain amount of moles of our starting material here. And we'll just call that Call that alpha. And we have some starting amount of oxygen. I'm just going to put a number to it for the sake of, of making this um, usable. Let's just say we've got 15 moles of oxygen. zero CO2 and zero water. Let's say we have excess oxygen, so we're burning all of our organic compounds. This is more or less how we would do this. Add an excess of oxygen, burn it, look at what the new moles of gas is in your system, and assume that you have none of your starting material left whether you know how many moles that is or not. So what is, let's leave oxygen alone for a second. What is our change for CO2? Is it positive or negative for starters? Positive, we're making CO2. How much CO2? And alpha times X. So remember how these work. If, it, if we were dealing with numbers instead of X, Y, and Z, 
whatever your stoichiometry is for a CO2, that's how many you're making relative to your change over here, right? So if our coefficient is one here and it's X over there, we're making X times more carbons. We can do the same thing over here, right? And the oxygen starts looking really painful at this point. But our change is going to be minus alpha times x plus y over 4 minus z over 2. So does that actually get us anything useful? Well, not as such at this point, but at the very least, it reminds us that remember that every, every row and every column of this table, of your ice table, is its own linear equation. Your total moles of starting material is your is just adding up your initial moles here. Your total moles at the end is adding up this bottom row. Your total, your change in oxygen is adding up the column underneath oxygen. So you can say, okay, my final concentration of oxygen is whatever I have at the end. Or sorry, whatever I have at the end initially minus whatever I used up equals concentration at the end. So if you have some way of measuring moles of oxygen at the end, we start being able to write algebraic expressions here. We could say, okay, well, my total moles of gas at the beginning is equal to this based on PV equals NRT. And I can measure pressure, I can measure volume, I can measure temperature. So, I couldn't just give you a general solution here, but basically there's only four variables involved here. The five if you count oxygen, but oxygen is usually going to be a no because it's a pure substance and it's always the same and we can add as, as much as we want. So basically you would need four pieces of information, five if you count moles of oxygen, to be able to figure this out. You could, and it could be total starting moles. If you know your moles of oxygen and you know your total starting moles, you can figure out what alpha is. It could be your total number of moles at the end, where you can say, okay, well, I know I have none of my unknown left, but I have a some certain amount of oxygen that I can write an expression for, and I have a certain amount of CO2 and a certain amount of water. I can't tell which one's which, but I can tell the total moles of gas is this. And then you can do something like, well, I have this system of gas. If I cool it down enough, I can get the water to condense. So you could figure out how many moles of water you had or you made over the course of the reaction by just changing the temperature and looking at PV equals NRT. And yet, okay, well, I know that my total moles of gas at the end is this. And I know that at the end, I made this many moles of water just by subtracting, doing a subtraction. It starts to get to be things we actually measure, but we still have to be, get clever with the algebra to actually get the formula for it. So I won't say it's a trivial solution, um, but it's nothing you haven't seen before once you have this sort of way we could do a general solution. I think it's trickier, like if we're doing an organic compound that might have nitrogen in it, then that's going to change this, right? Or if it, make, it would make it more simpler if we knew it was a hydrocarbon that had no oxygen in it, because that eliminates one of our variables. We can get rid of Z, essentially, if we know that there's no oxygen. But yeah, so Saturday night, this is what I was doing from 
two fifteen to three fifteen in the morning when I was trying to sleep. Um, and I just thought I would share because I give you all these formulas. This is why we know we don't know what the compound is, but we know it's CaH fourteen O four because we can get clever with algebra and gas laws and shit. All right, what time is it? I can't see the clock. Let's, okay, so before we move on completely, um, wanted to address the fact that I didn't get a chance to, to tweak the quiz questions, considering we didn't have a second lecture um, with reactions. So there were some reactions in there that we hadn't covered yet. Um, apologies, I'll make sure that everybody's score is not, uh, or reflects that we had not covered benzylic oxidation and the other one, um, what's the name of that reaction? Birch reduction. Um, the birch reduction and benzylic oxidation were the two reactions that I asked about on the quiz, and that was not intentional. Um, I just didn't get a chance to, it slipped my mind, but I have, when something throws off my schedule at the end of the week, in my normal routine, things get thrown out the window, and I forgot to double check the, your quiz, so I apologize for that. But it still, hopefully, was a good opportunity to go through and try and look at the textbook and figure out what was going on. I think the trickiest one, the benzylic oxidation was not too bad um, because it's basically just like any of our other oxidations, you've got chromium with a really high oxidation state, you're gonna oxidize something. Um, this is one of the few reactions that will actually add an oxygen in a predictable spot when you oxidize, as opposed to most of our, our organic oxidations, you needed to have an alcohol there already. And so we can take an alcohol and turn it into a carbonyl or a carboxylic acid. Um, this is one of the few that will actually add the oxygen and oxidize it all the way as well. Um, but it only works if there's a hydrogen on that benzylic carbon. So that tells us something about the mechanism. It also just means if you've got T-butyl benzene, the reaction doesn't happen, um, which is Kind of interesting. So we'll do some practice with that. We'll take our break. Let's come back at nine in 10 minutes and we'll talk, we'll work through those, those reactions that were on the quiz and then we'll work with the quiz problems specifically and check out how everybody 
So the uh, quiz question. NBS, right? Yeah. I thought about that. And so that one we actually have had before, right? The NBS exposure um, for a benzylic carbon, we, we treated it mostly. In fact, Hannah, wasn't that one, one of your reactions for your um, synthesis project was NBS? Yeah. Um, for the quiz question, though, said like one equivalent with heat, and then it added. Um, Okay. Yes. So, and the fact that that was happening sequentially just meant that you were going to have have uh, two reactions in sequence happening. So let's actually bring up the actual quiz question. We'll talk about it. I wasn't sure what the so not necessarily so remember that all of our old reactions still hold so nbs is going to brominate it in the benzylic position adding heat in tbok um, is going to make it go through an elimination reaction so So number one, and the heat's just gonna make it go go faster. Okay. Um, you don't need the NBS, you need something to start the reaction. So sometimes you'll see NB. It's unusual to see just NBS. Usually it'll be NBS and heat or NBS and light. You need something to get it going to start the free radical process, but it's not really the picky because it doesn't take much to, to get NBS to dissociate into radicals. Um, so heat works. Usually we'd, we'd be in the, the habit of writing light for a free radical reaction, um, but it doesn't change anything really. And then the second one would be the elimination. So your final product would be styrene, which would be the, um, a benzene ring with a um, double bond, yeah, for on the benzylic carbon. And then the birch production is classic, um, but we'll get to that in more detail in a second. So if we have the, the thing about the, the um, benzylic oxidation is that it's, it's not really controllable via stoichiometry. The chromium is so good at oxidizing whatever you put it with that you're not going to be able to really pick and choose, even, even if you're very careful about the stoichiometry. So basically, everything that has every benzylic carbon that has a hydrogen gets turned into a carboxylic acid, and you just chop off the rest of the carbons. Um, likely, they just get fully oxidized into CO2. Um, then you don't even get any other byproducts that are salvageable, really. Chromium is really, really rough on, on organic materials, um, which means that this is a really easy reaction to do because just you have a benzylic carbon. Does the benzylic carbon have a hydrogen? If so, try to turn it into a carboxylic acid and ignore whatever else was attached. So for A, we just get benzoic acid. For B, we get benzoic acid. I believe that's phthalic acid. Is um, when you put two two acid groups on the same benzene ring. But regardless of what it's named. Get that. Yeah, I believe that that is that. Would, so that would be or terra terra phthalic acid. Yeah, phthalic is uh, 
Yeah. So I, I'm not. I'm. My thinking, actually, the Terra, the Terra does not have to do with. It might, but I believe that this would be meta phthalic acid and ortho phthalic acid is one you can make um, phthalic anhydride. Um, but I'm having trouble. I remember doing something in grad school. One of my compounds was terephthalate, but it was para terephthalate to make it a linear structure. I don't think remember what linear terephthalate versus phthalate, but beside the point. Um, so for C, again, it has to have a benzoic hydrogen for this to work. So you would put a carboxylic acid group there, there. And the, the T butyl group, you're just going to leave it the way it is. So for C, what's the verdict? It's Terra from the genus name. So para para phthalic acid is also Terra phthalic acid. Okay. At least I'm not completely losing my mind. I knew that it that that was a thing. So for C, this would be our product. Again, the carbon doesn't have a benzoic acid; stays the way it is. Everything else turns into a benzoic, a um, benzoic acid or carboxylic acid, which. All things considered, considering some of the um, exceptions and variables we have to consider with these mechanisms, that's a pretty easy one to remember. Um, fairly straightforward. And the nice thing about benzene rings is they're planar, so we don't even have to worry about like cis and trans. Um, and there is so remember when we were talking about conjugated dienes, we said that there was a barrier between them switching from the S cis to the S trans form. Remember we're talking about there, there is a barrier there because of the resonance. There will also be some amount of a barrier for these to rotate around, but it's a sort of barrier that you're going to see. It's of a level that at room temperature, they're going to be fruit maybe not freely rotating, but they're not hindered enough that you would need to specify, you know, specifically which direction is the carboxyl, is the carbonyl oxygen and which one is the OH. It's gonna be, you know, able to rotate pretty freely. So no stereochemistry to worry about for that one. Just thanks for a change. All right, so this is just a, a um, recap of all the reactions that we've seen benzylic carbons involved in. Um, again, nothing that's particularly new. Um, you can do radical bromination that brominates the benzylic carbon, and then from there you can do SN1 or SN2, just like we've seen before. Um, you can take a benzylic carbon and oxidize it using dichromate to make the carboxylic acid. And you can do that if it's a secondary benzylic, except the tertiary um, benzylic carbon as well. You just need at least one hydrogen there. Um, and then can't go through elimination reactions if you have another carbon. You can't go through an elimination reaction for this top example because the elimination reaction, you can't make five bonds to a carbon, so you can't put a double bond here, and there is no other carbon for it to attach to. So you were to, to make the, the pi bond. So basically, if you if it's just a single methyl group attached to a benzene, you eliminate it to radical bromination, and then you can do substitution. But that's basically just a function of the formula. It's not really, um, I won't say it's not tricky, but it's, it should make sense, right? 
can't do an elimination reaction if you only have one carbon in the reactant. Um, if nothing else you think of it, you need a hydrogen on an adjacent carbon on an alpha carbon in order to go through elimination. And there's no hydrogen on this benzene carbon here. Um, hydrogenation reactions don't really apply to benzene. You can get benzene to do it. It is downhill in energy, but not by very much. And you have to get up to about 100 atmospheres with the catalyst and high temperatures for that to happen. It's doable. Um, and once you start the reaction, it's easy if you can continue it. So if you can find a way to catalyze break the aromaticity somehow, you can get the reaction to continue a lot easier. But if you're just starting from pure benzene, trying to hydrogenate it like we would with an alkene, doesn't really work very well. I mean, 100 atmospheres is nothing to sneeze at even in industrial chemistry. So in a lab setting, that's really pretty, pretty rough. But delta H, does show that it was favored. Cyclohexane is more favorable, um, but getting to cyclohexane is really, really hard. The flip side of this means that if you do have other groups that you want to hydrogenate, you can usually ignore any benzene. So if just because you have a benzene ring attached, if you, have, if you want to hydrogenate a double bond, that's totally possible because you can rely on the fact that the benzene ring is not going to react. Right? So if you just look at um, you know, whatever is attached to the benzene ring, it's going to hydrogenate pretty easily. So platinum, so another metal catalyst, but we're talking two atmospheres of pressure at 25 Celsius instead of 100 atmospheres of pressure at 150 Celsius. And just breaking one pi bond, if you, if you look at, at the, the stoichiometry here, we broke one pi bond and added one molecule of H2, and it was negative 117 kilojoules per mole. Which means if we weren't considering resonance and aromaticity, we would expect this top reaction to be giving off three times that because breaking three pi bonds, right? So that would put us in the realm of 300, I don't know, 351 kilojoules of energy given off. And we're like half of that, just about. That tells us um, how much of a role the aromaticity is playing. Basically, the being aromatic is stabilizing those pi bonds to the tune of 100 and 150 kilojoules per mole. So, getting a lot of stabilization from that. Um, which reminds me. Didn't talk about aromatic, anti aromatic, or neither for these. So, just while we're talking about aromaticity, let's consider these real quick. So, what are our criteria for whether something's aromatic? Conjugated ring. Odd number of electron pairs. So as long as, we, if it's a conjugated ring and you can resonate all the way around it, meaning you don't have any part of the ring that's sp3, um, or an sp3 carbon um, that without a lone pair. So that, and that's where it gets kind of tricky, right? Because if there's a lone pair that looks like on a nitrogen, say, that looks like it should be sp3, the fact that it has the lone pair that can resonate means that that doesn't keep it. It's not really sp3, right? So that's the tricky part with that one. So for one, we've got rings all the way around 
we would normally expect that bottom right carbon to be sp3 based on the number of electron pairs because it's got four electron groups but one of them is a lone pair which means it can participate in resonance which means that lone pair counts as one of those pairs when we're counting for an odd number so one would be aromatic two Again, the sulfur looks like it should be sp3, but one of but it has lone pairs that can resonate, which means it's going to actually behave like it's sp2. So that gives us three electron pairs. That's a molecule called thiophene. I also worked with conjugated thiophenes in grad school. Um, so that one's also going to be aromatic. What about three? Yeah, so it's an even number of electron pairs because both of those oxygens could have resonance, right? They both have a long pair. Um, the fact that, that we could actually choose because, and not really choose, but the, the molecule is going to settle into whatever form is more stable, right? Um, and so both oxygens could have a lone pair resonating, which would give us an even number of electron pairs and make it anti-aromatic. Um, it's actually more stable if one of the oxygens just doesn't let its lone pair resonate then. It behaves like it's sp3. It breaks up the resonance, but it keeps it from being anti-aromatic. So for this one, I would accept either anti-aromatic or non-aromatic. Um, its actual behavior is more like a non-aromatic. It won't be planar when you actually, you actually look at the structure of this molecule because treating one of those oxygens, forcing it to, to be sp3 means it avoids being anti-aromatic. Um, For it to be anti-aromatic, it just has to be planar and like fit the non-aromatic structure. Right. So planar, so even number of electron pairs. So it makes it anti-aromatic. So anti-aromatic has to meet all the same criteria as aromatic, but with an even number of electron pairs. But most things that could fit that criteria have a way of avoiding that by either breaking up the resonance, like we were just talking about, or by not being planar. In order for resonance to happen, they have to be planar so that you can get those p orbitals to overlap. And so if something's not planar, it can't be anti-aromatic or aromatic. If, if it's planar, then it could be one or the other. Um, and so since anti-aromatic is less stable than just non-aromatic, if we have enough room for it to move, it'll, it'll by default avoid being anti-aromatic by acting non-aromatic instead. So four, sp2 all the way around, just remember carbocations are sp2. And it doesn't count as a lone pair because it's an open spot, not an extra pair of electrons. So it's an odd number of electrons, electron pairs, and it's rest conjugated all the way around. So this one would be aromatic. I suppose I could be filling these in as well. Five, as soon as you get one of those atoms in your ring that is, doesn't have a lone pair and can't make the pi bonds, then it's going to be non, non aromatic. Right? So you broke up the resonance by having that there. It's very similar to number three. So number three has the, it kind of has the option. It could go whatever way is more stable because it has has the lone pairs, but it doesn't have to use them if that's going to make it less stable. It's only going to use the lone pairs to resonate if it makes it more stable. So it's not like the atom is actually picking and choosing so much as whatever is more stable is going to be what happens. And so in the case of, um, but in the case of five, we don't even have that option. 
because there are no lone pairs on that carbon. And same for six. You've got two carbons that are no longer, or that are not conjugated, that aren't SP2. So this one would be non aromatic as well. Really, anti aromatic is really uncommon just because usually there is some way for the molecule to tweak its geometry or not share a lone pair that allows it to be non-aromatic instead of, of anti-aromatic. Um, like anti yeah, it's uh, it's really not a, it's really a, a fine point, almost splitting hairs to decide between them because pretty much everything that you could say is anti-aromatic, you could also be say non-aromatic but just as correct, um, just for different reasons. All right, so our last, this is kind of a weird chapter because the focus on this chapter is on aromaticity and not so much on reactions because there aren't a whole lot of reactions break up benzene rings. The next chapter, we're going to spend more time on, um, on what we can do sort of around a benzene ring. So electrophilic substitutions, electrophilic aromatic substitutions is going to be the next chapter. Um, so this chapter's reactions don't really fit like a, a theme um, or like an underlying like similar mechanism like a lot of the chapters it's basically well not much breaks up a benzene ring but here's a couple of weird things that happen sometimes um in the next chapter we'll have one cohesive mechanism the whole way through the chapter so the, the birch reduction is a weird one it's a, you might notice it's a lot it's really similar to the dissolving metal reaction which was when we had a, a uh, an alkene no, sorry, an alkyne that we want it to selectively reduce to make it an alkene and leave it trans. We could use metal or sodium metal and ammonia, and that gave us the trans partial hydrogenation. Um, and so we kind of see something similar here. It's not so much that it's giving us the trans partial hydrogenation, but it gives us a partial hydrogenation of benzene. Um, and it doesn't just do this. This is what it's most well known for, but, but you can reduce a number of the birch reduction, the same reaction conditions work with a number of, of functional groups. Um, but this is the one that's most well known. Um, and you will always only break one of the three pi bonds when you do this. So it breaks the aromaticity, breaks one of the pi bonds, but not all of the pi bonds. Um, and it breaks them up in a way that's kind of interesting because it, it breaks them up in a way that prevents them from being conjugated. You'll notice that we now have, not only did we break the aromaticity, we have two sp3 carbons in between the two pi bonds. So we don't even have a conjugated diene anymore. We have an isolated diene. So that's a, that's what makes this reaction kind of unique is the way that it avoids conjugation in your product, which is the opposite of what we're used to looking for, right? Um, and the mechanism is weird. It's a free radical mechanism but not the way we're used to thinking about it. It's a free radical mechanism because sodium metal is a free radical. Because sodium metal has one extra electron it's trying to give away, right? And so what happens is, um, we wind up breaking the aromaticity in order to make room for that extra pair, that extra electron. And so you make, you wind up with your benzene ring turning into something that's got a, a lone pair on one carbon and a free radical on the opposite carbon. And those are going to, they stay as far away from each other as possible. 
when this is happening. So that's kind of what keeps it from becoming um, conjugated is the fact that the free radical and the anion stay as far away as possible. And the, the reasoning for that is basically that having the lone pair adjacent to two pi bonds means those two pi bonds can resonate with the lone pair and make it a little more stable at the same time as those two pi bonds can be donating electron density to the free radical and making it more stable. But if you put the lone pair right next to the free radical, that doesn't really work. They don't, they're not able to share as well and resonate as well. And so you start by making a radical anion, which then protonate with the methanol. And now all of a sudden you made yourself an sp3 carbon that can't resonate anymore. And, but you still have a free radical that is stabilized by a pair of ions. But then if you have more sodium around, you wind up turning that free radical into a lone pair. And now you've got another thing that you can protonate. So it's really the trickiest part is really just this first step. You get this first step to make the radical anion and then you do a proton transfer and then donate an electron and another proton transfer, but showing this first one is the trickiest part. And then, you, so then your final result is you wind up with two sp3 carbons on opposite sides of the ring from each other. The fact that the, where we put the sp2 carbons is significant means that now all of a sudden we're back to worrying about stereochemistry again. So essentially, if you have a substituted benzene instead of just benzene, you only get um, the stereoisomers where you put where your electron donating substituent is on one of the reduced carbons. So if you have an electron donating substituent, which is anything with a lone pair, anything, any um, alkyl groups are electron donating, then you're always going to put that electron donating group next to the pi bond. I think I said that backwards the first time, apologies. Um, electron withdrawing substituents do the opposite. And electron withdrawing substituents are anytime you've got a conjugated pi bond. So if, if you have a pi bond that could resonate, that's electron withdrawing. If you have a lone pair or you just have an R group, that's electron donating. And the electron donating substituent will always be attached to one of the remaining pi bonds. An electron withdrawing substituent will always be attached to the carbon that got produced. So we'll practice with that. So again, first reduction means two pi bonds opposite sides. It's just a matter of where are you putting them to try and satisfy this as much as possible. Electron donating wants to still be attached to a pi bond. Electron withdrawing wants to be attached to one of the reduced carbons. So for A, let me clean this up a little bit so we have room to, to um, draw these structures. 
All right, so for A, we need to put so our general product for all of these birch reactions, birch reductions. That's our general reaction, our product. We want to put that so that an electron donating group is still attached to the pi bonds. So in our group, just an alkyl group, that's electron donating. So with that in mind, we just need to draw our product so that our electron donating group is still attached to a pi bond, which is not too tricky in this case. There's a lot of ways to draw. Basically, you don't want to draw the isopropyl group attached. to the these new fully reduced carbons. As long as you don't put your isopropyl group on one of those, it's fine. If we have two substituents, we try to satisfy both of them where, where possible. There will be some, some combinations where it's not possible to draw an isomer that satisfies everything, and we'll talk about what to do with that in a minute. So we have two R groups, two electron donating groups. We want both of them to be attached to a pi bond. Get this product. They're on adjacent carbons. So if we're going to have both of them attached to a pi bond and neither of them attached to one of these fully reduced carbons, SP3 carbons, then we need to have them as part of the same function, assembly, part of the same alkene. Right? And the nice thing about these is there's only ever going to be three possibilities, right? Because there's only three ways that you can put the two sp3 carbons on opposite of each other on a hexagon, right? So if you just keep the substituents drawn where they are, the three possible ways to draw that is just going to be, you know, rotate where the sp3 carbon is and see if what you drew is favorable or not. So the There'd be another possibility. There's the other possibility. So three different ways. One, two, three. You can orient the SP3 carbons. Pick the one that, that satisfies your R groups the best. This one. So I'll give you a, a second to work on B. Is that a try? Yeah. 
three ways to arrange this one. There's two that satisfy. Um, our criteria that that we both our groups still attached either the same molecule or are they two different possibilities? Yeah, if you picture taking the one on the left and holding it at both ends and spinning it. Flipping it like a pancake this way, you get that one. And you don't need to worry about cis and trans because these are both still attached to the same, or they're both still attached to sp2 carbon, so they're going to be planar relative to, to the ring. What about E? Electron donating or withdrawing? Withdrawing. Pi bonds are always going to be electron withdrawing because the resonance structures that they can undergo are always going to be pulling electron density out of the benzene ring. So, with that in mind, if it's electron withdrawing, it's going to be the opposite of what we were trying to do up here. We want to make sure that our electron withdrawing group is on one of the fully reduced carbons. So basically breaking up electron, breaking up resonance. So our possibilities here then That's not going to work because that puts our electron withdrawal group on a pi bond. And that's what we're trying to avoid. That one does work. When you only have one substituent, it's pretty pretty easy to figure out how to orient it, right? It's never a bad idea to draw two possibilities and then cross one out if you're not sure how it, what it looks like. But and usually there's going to be a way to satisfy everything. There's a way to make everything happy in this in this reaction. It's pretty rare, and I think you have to get to try substituted benzenes before you start seeing possibility of not everything can be satisfied. The try substituted benzene, there's a possibility that you have, say, three electron donating groups all adjacent to each other, and there's not a way to actually make all of them satisfied. All right, so what about C? And if you're not sure, try all three possibilities. So we could have the sp3 carbons up and down. We have our sp3 carbons as a forward slash. Or sp3 carbons as a backslash. Which of those satisfies both of our substituents? First one. Yeah. 
regardless of if you only have two substituents, I think mathematically, I, I think you can say that there's always a way to satisfy both of them. There's enough possibilities that you can always make them both satisfy. Sometimes it just takes drawing all three possibilities before you see it. So then for F, if you have an electron withdrawing group, that's almost the easiest one because you know you know where you have to put one of your sp3 carbons, right? You know where one of your sp3 carbons is, the other sp3 carbon has to be exactly opposite of it. So that makes these fairly straightforward. There's one of our sp3 carbons. The other one has to be opposite. So in that case, we don't even really need to because it's okay. So here's the way that you could have two substituents and not be able to satisfy it. If you have two electron withdrawing substituents and they're not exactly opposite of each other. That's it. That's the only possibility um, for to not be able to satisfy both of them. In that case, look at which one is more strongly electron withdrawn, and you satisfy that one. And we'll talk about what that means. Um, We'll leave it at that for now. We'll talk about how to rate that, how you decide what gets satisfied first. Um, you have to choose. Um, this is just with five minutes left. Um, just a couple of things about spectroscopy of aromatics specifically. Um, because there are a few things that you can see that show up only with aromatics. So for IR spectroscopy, it's this first section over here doesn't look any different than what we would expect for alkenes. You have you have CH peaks above three thousand. That you can't really tell the difference between that and alkene. But a lot of times the aromatics you wind up with what they call overtones, which is a lot like harmonics in terms of of waves, um, where you get this sort of repetitive. Um, Repetitive small peaks that either share the same general trend or they'll or sometimes they'll be about the same strength, but they'll be the same. You'll see three or four peaks in a row that are about the same distance apart in the same strength. Um, if you see that, that's sort of a it's not enough of a smoking gun to say for sure you have an aromatic, but if you think you might, that's definitely a piece of information that could that could help you. And then you start getting into the, and you see those sort of in no man's land in between where the carbonyls would be and carbon hydrogens um, bonds would be. So they're in that sort of flat region around um, somewhere. Sometimes you start seeing the um, carbonyls and you, you, know, you might see your carbonyl peak right in the middle of this for some of these um, or at one end of it. Um, and you might notice the, this graph in particular is not a linear scale on the y-axis. So be careful just looking at it qualitatively because it zooms in on the fingerprint region here because that's where you see the most obvious um, signs. And obvious might be the wrong word because there's, you still have to go into the fingerprint region to see them, but they do still have some of these repetitive features that they show up lower in energy. So they're not as easy to recognize. The overtones are really distinctive if they show up, sometimes they get lost in the noise. If this is not a nice clean section right here, sometimes it'd be really hard to see those. They'll always be there. They might not always be something you could interpret, right? Just like the fingerprint region. These will always be there, but when it's buried inside of a whole bunch of other stuff, you might not be able to tell what it is you're looking at. 
but we already know that NMRs, pair for aromatics, are really easy to tell, right? They always show up in the same section. And a lot of times between the integration and where it shows up, that's going to be your most obvious cases, right? They show up really obviously in proton NMR. You can't always trust the splitting unless you have one of two things. If it's a case where all of your protons on the benzene ring are right, are identical to each other, then that's like our example we looked at earlier, where it'll show up you know, with zero splitting because all of your protons are identical to each other. So it shows up all as one signal. And so that's only going to happen when the, if you have a dye substituted benzene. I guess you could have it with a tri substituted benzene if it was symmetric, meaning that all of your substituents were the same and they were split thirds away of benzene ring, around the benzene ring. But this is more common is when they're in, on opposite sides of the benzene ring, when they pair up relative to each other, and your two substituents are the exact same thing. The other possibility would be if you happen to have a benzene ring where you had three identical substituents that were in thirds around the benzene ring. That would also make three identical protons here that were gonna sh would show up with no splitting um, and all is one peak, but your integration would only be three in that case. So either if your aromatic region is just one peak with no splitting, it means that all of your protons are same. The other case is if you get a doublet of doublets in your aromatic region. So if you have something that looks like this in your aromatic region, that means that um, the only way that that happens is if you have two different substituents and they're exactly opposite of each other. And in that case, that resolves the peaks enough, pulls them apart enough and you can actually trust the splitting that you actually would see this. So you can still see an integration of four in that case. And you can actually assign which of the two peaks that you can actually treat them like separate peaks. But more commonly, you just get something that looks like this. You have a whole bunch of stuff on top of each other. And you just integrate the whole mess. And then you guys have been working with carbon 13 and MR for aromatics to some extent, and how the number of signals in the aromatic region will tell you the substitution. It gets a little bit trickier. This is a pretty useful figure that's in the textbook and it's also in the slides. So if you're still working on figuring out the substitution from last week's assignment, um, this might be um, a helpful figure to determine whether you have to identical substituents and where they are relative to each other. And just since I'm not going to see you folks later today, one final thought. Um, Rickney's ask me a random question was, was a little in depth, but part of it is relevant to everybody. Um, Brittany asked about what we do if we look at the visible spectrum for organic compounds. And the problem with that is most organic compounds don't absorb in the visible spectrum. Visible spectrum is too high of an energy for vibrational thing, um, things to show up, like we would expect from IR, but it's not high enough that you would actually get an electronic transition, like a homo jumping to volumo. You have to get into the UV region for that, which is why a lot of organic compounds fluoresce under UV light. But you, you basically, they're all going to look identical in the visible region because none of them absorb in the visible region. Unless it's colored, that's a really easy way to tell whether something will absorb light in the visible region. Is it, if it absorbs in the visible region, it's going to be colored or it's going to be black. If it has any color to it, then that means it absorbs somewhere in the visible region. If it's black, 
he means it's absorbing everything in the visible region, which is not necessarily any easier to, to tell what's going on than it is. Um, but there's a reason we stick to looking at the IR, and it's because all of these organic bonds all um, vibrate in the right frequency for IR. But you can't usually use electronic transitions, which is what UV is, is in the right ballpark of when it comes to the energy. Just a, a note about that. All right. Which I am going to see you today. Today's not Thursday. Oh, wait, I was going to say, like, do, do we have left? We do have left today. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Um, I'm just, this lecture is felt like it's a week, not because of you guys, just because of my head. So, all right. Yes, I will see everybody later today. Okay. But let's, uh, let's take a break for a bit. It does kind of feel like Thursday. I don't know. Here. The snow. Yeah. It, feels, it feels like yesterday. Yesterday took a lot out of me because of the snow. Okay, so I have, I have to run some errands, but I'll do this one Okay. Sounds good.